Hello friends and welcome to our video lecture on topic A2.2 cell structure. This is our additional higher level content. If you are in SLIB bio, this is not relevant to the assessment that you're going to take. Um, higher level friends, keep listening. Guiding questions are the same as our first lecture on topic A2.2. What are the features common to all cells and what are the features that are different? And how is microscopy used to investigate cell structure? We're not going to answer these questions fully. We're just going to layer on some extra super cool details. That first lecture is where you're going to get the majority of the content that answers those questions. Our objectives for today, we're going to describe endosymbiotic theory. We're going to outline the evolution of multicellularity. We're going to talk very briefly about cell differentiation. So first up, just a quick review. What even are these eukaryotic cells that we're going to be talking about? Remember that eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus. That all rhymes. Eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus. We're talking about animal cells, plant cells, fungus cells, and protocells. Um, protists, remember, are those single-celled organisms that like to live, especially in ponds. So euglena and paramecium, amoebas, um, super cool single-celled pond living organisms that do have nuclei. These eukaryotic cells have lots of other membrane-bound organelles beyond the nucleus. We're going to look at some mitochondria, and we're going to talk about chloroplasts a lot today. So this theory of endosymbiosis is so cool. Uh, endo means inside, sim means together, and bio means life. So we're talking about cells going inside each other and then living happily ever after together. And the story goes like this. We had this ancestral host cell. It was a prokaryote, so it was a um, no nucleus cell, bacteria cell. Scientists, I love this so much, scientists call this ancestral cell Asgard. How fabulous is that? So what happened to this Asgardian cell is that its plasma membrane started to fold in it made these big wrinkles and those wrinkles started to merge around the DNA that was just floating around in the nucleoid region of the cell. This eventually led to the formation of the nucleus. So now we have a cell with a nucleus. And then what this cell did was endocytosis, which is endo cytosis. So the cell is pulling stuff inside it. And so the plasma membrane of Asgard folded in and engulfed this bacteria cell that was really good at making ATP. It was an aerobic bacterial cell, really good at making ATP. But instead of digesting this bacteria cell instead of breaking it down and killing it, what happened was the host cell started feeding it glucose and oxygen. And then that aerobic cell started pumping ATP out for the cell. And so they had this symbiotic relationship. They were helping each other survive a little bit better. Some cells, way cooler than our animal cells, also engulfed some cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria, can you guess? They're really good at photosynthesis. And so again, that plasma membrane surrounded the bacteria, engulfed it, and instead of digesting it, they formed a relationship that was mutually beneficial. This cell eventually, we think, evolved into mitochondria. This bacteria, cell, these cyanobacteria, eventually evolved into chloroplasts. How cool is that? And this is just kind of showing in the tree of life how we took some of those bacteria cells and plopped them into other bacteria cells to make our eukaryotic cells. Amazing. But it sounds like a crazy story, right? How do we know this happened? There's actually lots of evidence for the endosymbiotic theory. First of all, those double membranes around chloroplasts and mitochondria, we think how those double membranes formed is this. We had the plasma membrane of the host cell, Asgard, and then we had that bacteria cell. This membrane became the outer membrane. And then the original membrane of the bacteria cell is the inner membrane. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have double membranes. They have outer and inner membranes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts also have their own DNA. And what's super cool is that DNA is more similar to prokaryotic DNA than it is to eukaryotic DNA, the DNA that we have in our nuclei. Mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA is circular not linear. We have linear DNA in our nucleus, circular DNA is in bacteria, and also in our mitochondria. Mitochondria have their own DNA. Also, it is naked DNA 
It has no histones. Histones are those proteins that DNA wraps around that's only in the DNA that's in our nucleus. Histones are um, helping to organize the DNA in our nucleus. There are no histones on the DNA in mitochondria or in chloroplasts. Super cool, right? But wait, there's more. Also, mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own ribosomes, and those ribosomes are what we call 70S ribosomes. So this idea of a 70S ribosome just means it's a little bit smaller than the ribosomes that we have outside our mitochondria and chloroplasts. So our free ribosomes and the ribosomes that are bound to our rough ER are ADS ribosomes. They're a little bit bigger. S stands for Svedberg. There's a scientist, he liked to spin ribosomes in a centrifuge, which is this super cool spinny thing that makes more dense things sink further in a test tube than less dense things. And so the bigger ribosomes sunk 80 units down the test tube, whereas the smaller ribosomes only sank 70 units down the ribosomes, or sorry, down the test tube, down the test tube. Um, and so the ribosomes that make proteins in our rough ER and in our cytoplasm outside mitochondria are ADS a little bit bigger. The 70S ribosomes in our chloroplasts and mitochondria match the ribosomes that are in bacteria. Bacterial cells have 70S ribosomes. Super cool. Also, mitochondria and chloroplasts divide via binary fission, which is the same way of cell division in bacteria cells. So mitochondria and chloroplasts reproduce independently of the rest of the cell, and they reproduce via binary fission, which is the same way as bacteria cells reproduce. And this might be the coolest, but most concerning piece of evidence for endosymbiosis. Mitochondria and chloroplasts are susceptible to antibiotics, antibiotics like penicillin, tetracycline. These guys are medicines that only affect prokaryotic cells. So there are certain metabolic processes in bacterial cells that antibiotics can interfere with. It's often going to be translation. Translation is the process by which we take messenger RNA and turn it into proteins on our ribosomes. Those 70S ribosomes, if you are a bacteria or a chloroplast or a mitochondria. Um, but, but what's interesting is that our mitochondria and our chloroplasts can be killed by antibiotics, just like bacteria can be. The rest of our human cells, no issues with antibiotics, but our mitochondria, a little bit susceptible. Um, and so, so we have some concerns about our mitochondria and our chloroplasts if we are overusing those antibiotics. So we are pretty sure that our eukaryotic cells evolved due to this endosymbiotic theory. Crazy cool. But then we went and had to go get multicellular. So those protocells, we think one of our theories um, is that these cells just started to form colonies. And so they made an aggregate and then there was a hollow sphere inside and then they started to fold and those cells became um, differentiated into reproductive cells or endothelial cells or epithelial cells and did all kinds of super cool things. Um, and eventually over time, these multicellular organisms had the advantage of larger body sizes. And then we eventually formed some specialized cell tissues. So we think, we think that this uh, first multicellularity evolved about 600 million years ago. We think that the first, the first life, that first prokaryotic life on Earth was about 3.7 billion years ago. That's the same as 3,700 million years ago. So a long time with just prokaryotes um, and, and single-celled organisms, not until just about 600 million years ago, we started to get some uh, multicellular organisms. As humans, only six million years ago, we think, is when us humans first started popping up on the planet. One of the disadvantages of being a multicellular organism is that we do need to have some specialized cells. And so how does this even happen? Um, we start as single-celled zygotes, and that single-celled zygote only has one set of DNA. And all of our cells, except for red blood cells, so red blood cells or erythrocytes, erythrocytes is the fancy word for red blood cell, um, in us humans are what we call anucleate. So they actually lose 
their nucleus, nucleus, they have, they are without, remember that prefix A means without, so they are without a nucleus um, by the time they reach maturation. So they don't actually have the same DNA as all the other cells because they don't have any DNA. Um, but all the other cells in our body have all the same DNA. And so how do we end up with our big toe cells looking different from our brain cells, looking different from our liver cells? Well, what happens is different gene expression. So we will turn on and off different genes in different cells so that we can build these beautiful specialized cells like a nerve cell or a skin cell. We're going to talk super briefly here. We'll talk a lot more about this when we get to our genetics unit on how do we turn on and off these different genes. And one way is um, with this idea of acetyl groups and methyl groups. So we can acetylate, we can go through this process of acetylation. Um, and what we do is we add, here are our histone proteins. Here's that DNA. We can add these acetyl groups, and the acetyl groups cause the DNA to open up a little bit. They get more spread out, and that allows for the transcription factors that take the DNA and turn the DNA into messenger RNA, which then can be turned into the protein, opens it up a little bit, makes it easier for that messenger RNA to get made by those proteins, those transcription factors. On the other hand, we have these methyl groups, and methyl groups cause the DNA to pack together super, super tightly. And so then it's really hard for those proteins to get to the DNA. They're kind of blocked from the genes that are on these pieces of DNA. And so then those genes just don't get expressed. So by having different patterns of acetyl groups and methyl groups, we can turn on and turn off different genes in different cells. Super, super cool. Um, how I remember this acetyl group, A is for access, so we can get to those genes and make the proteins from those genes. And then I remember that M is kind of like mute, we're making them quiet, we're turning them off. So methylation mutes those genes, acetylation allows for access of those genes. And my friends, we are already done with this lecture. Can you believe it? So we talked a little bit about the features common to all cells. They all have cytoplasm. Features that differ. We talked especially about that endosymbiotic theory and how we think we ended up with those different eukaryotic cells. And then microscopy and investigating cell structure, we wouldn't be able to see those um, pieces of ribosome and DNA in mitochondria and chloroplasts if it weren't for microscopy. We talked about endosymbiotic theory, how we think that eukaryotic cells evolved. We talked about multicellularity, that colonial theory. Um, it's just one of the many stories that we are working on. It's one of those pieces of science that we don't know all the answers to quite yet. Um, by the way, there are so many pieces of science we don't have all the answers to yet. And then we also talked very briefly about cell differentiation, that acetylation that allows for access of genes methylation that mutes those genes. Good work today.